Here we go. Get ready to have a good time. This is exciting, isn't it? All right, we're on. Hello, testing, testing, testing. Welcome aboard the Dreamliner. Hello, hello. These are the names of the pilots. Okay. Sum Ting Wong. Okay. We Too Low. Okay. And Ho Li Fook. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Four, three, two. He's Gary Meyer. Hello, Venezuela, Piatone, Illinois, and Detroit. Breaking news. Jeremy Meeks is a convicted felon and just served 27 months for felony gun charges. You bastard. But get this. His mugshot went viral because he's such a hunk. Ouch. That is hot. And now he's got a manager and is looking to do modeling, reality shows, and endorsement deals. Wait a minute. I have a TV idea for this guy. It's called Shank Tank. Um. Entrepreneurs try to sell the Shank's ideas on how prisoners can use the items found in their cells that they can fashion into weapons or tools that they can use to escape. Bomb, 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 bomb. Shanks, my name is Gary Meyer, and I'm seeking 1,000 cartons of cigarettes for 10% of the company. You sure got a pretty mouth. How many times have you been in prison and watched the Shawshank Redemption and thought, I love what Andy Dufresne is doing, but it took too long? Well, I've come up with the latest escape tool, a crucifix that converts into a power drill. That's quite a powerful thought, isn't it? That runs on batteries that you can smuggle into your prison cell. And you can hide the hole in the wall with a Kate Upton poster. This is major. Do you have the slightest idea of how important this is? Mr. Warden Kill? I'll give you 1,000 cartons for 25% of the company. No. 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 Deal. Okay. A New York City man shoved a Snickers bar in another man's face and then started to punch him. The whole Snickers campaign is people get so angry when they're hungry. See, if the Stunad had eaten the Snickers bar, he wouldn't be charged with a misdemeanor now. Numb nut. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Today's show coming to you from the Big Shouldered Studios in the Johnny Hancock building. You know what they say about studios with big shoulders? Yes. This is the Gear Force Radio Network. Hey now, Fafa Fui, Gary Meyer here. Welcome. How about that opening? A lot more jazzed up than the first two. I'm working on a lot of things, tweaking here and there, and I would say in, I don't know, a year and a half, two years at the most, everything will be up and running the way I want it, but I'm pretty excited about that, getting a little more production into the show, and hopefully every day something new will be better, and I hope you enjoy that and more to come in that style. Now, in just a few minutes, I will have part one of my conversation with Howard Stern, and then following the conversation, more show to come, and I'll cover video voyeurism, headbutting, and King Tut loses his beard. And I'm not talking about a wife or girlfriend that he had, his actual beard. And let's find out how that came off a little later in the program. About 10 years ago, I first met Howard, and I got a hold of him, and I said, hey, uh, can we get together? I'm going to be in New York very soon, and maybe we can get together for a cup of coffee, a fudge sickle, whatever you do. He said, sure, come on by. Why don't you come by the studio and you can sit in on a production meeting after the show, see how that works, and we'll talk, which I did. He could not have been more accommodating, could not have been nicer. And I did get to meet Fafa Fui. And he shares the same birthday as my daughter, so there's some parody there. At the point where we were talking, he said, well, I don't know what you're doing later in the evening, but why don't you and your wife come to this party that's being thrown for my girlfriend, now wife, And you might enjoy that. We said, fine. So we went to that. Big crowd. Howard's work in the room like a Stradivarius. My wife and I are standing there. We don't really know that many people. But all of a sudden, Howard comes over. Gary, Cynthia, Pam Anderson. And there was Pam Anderson right there. Uh, Hoochie mama, as Kramer would say. So that was the start of the friendship. And we've been friends ever since. And when I called him, A few weeks ago, I said, hey, I'm starting this new deal, and I can't think of anybody I'd like to talk to more than you about starting a new deal when you come from traditional radio like we both did. And he said, sure, love to do it. So I'm very excited to introduce you to my very first guest of this next chapter. 
He is the most Let's successful. Make, make me a mystery guest. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm going to give you clues. You have to guess. But I'm, I really, think I'm really good looking. He's really good looking. Very tall. Uh, could not be nicer. And could he be is sexier. That's the thing to stress. He's sexy. He's all the things you want him to be. But he is, most importantly, the most successful person ever to strap on a microphone in radio. Hall of Fame broadcaster, Mr. Howard Stern. Great to speak to you, Gary, and congratulations to you on whatever this is. Well, I think... Wait, explain I'm, what's going on. I think I'm going to find out, too. I've decided to go to the Internet because, as you well know, having followed in the same footsteps I had to follow in as far as commercial radio, at some point, I think they make you want to do something different. At least they indicate that it's time to do something different. And I thought, okay, I'm getting the hint now, and I'm going on to the Internet. And I think it's going to be the best yet. I really feel good about it. Well, I think it's a good move. I, I really do. I, I think that, uh, you know, you've had a long and uh, incredible career. And uh, with this, you know, your fans can find you and they can, you know, they can listen in on on what you're up to. And, you know, it, it seems like a, a really good uh, conclusion you've come to, you know. I don't know what the deal is with terrestrial radio. You and I started – at the same time, and that climb. When did the ter where did the term terrestrial radio come from? Is that because satellite radio came about? I guess so. I, yeah. I just assume that's the way everybody refers to it, or commercial yeah, we just radio. Went to radio, and then somehow it became terrestrial radio. But right, and yeah. and we came up through the same timetable. And right. I'll tell you what, and I I think you probably feel the same way when you got into it. Boy, it was exciting. And you just look forward to doing it every day. You didn't make any money, but that didn't matter because you had a goal out there. Or at least you just liked doing it. It didn't matter if the goal was ever achieved. But along the way, uh, something turned about 20 years ago or so. And it became just the part of a portfolio of a large corporation. And they kind of started to choke it a little bit. And I don't know why, because it's a great medium. But there's a lot of interference that makes it somewhat unpleasant, shall we say. Yeah, I think you you know, well, I mean you've said a lot, but the the uh going back to your, to, to the first thing you said, yeah, I, I don't I don't recall getting into radio cuz I thought I would make a lot of money. I I mean, I don't think anybody particularly uh when we started in radio thought that there'd be any money to be made in radio. So it was never like this endeavor where you would dream that uh you'd be making big bucks. It was you know, it, it just seemed to me like it was the most exciting thing in the world to be on the radio and have everybody hear uh, what I was saying. And uh, I just thought it was like the greatest thing in the world. So I didn't I didn't put a lot of thought into it. I never thought I'd, I could do anything else. And I had a tremendous passion for radio, as you do. And, um, you know, I thought actually radio was getting a little more exciting for a while. And uh, a lot of companies were taking risks. And I don't know, somewhere along the line, I, I think it just, as you say, became very corporate in that uh, it became cheaper to hire like one person and syndicate. And I'm, and I'm certainly one of the guys who started doing that. Uh, so, you know, I take some blame in that. But <laughs> I, I, you know, it, it seemed to me that they stopped investing in a lot of local talent. And they, they um, when I say they, you know, it, it just was, it just, it just seemed like everything uh, became very corporate and very stiff and rigid and very few risks were being taken. And I mean, it, it, for me, the, the government interference was crazy with the FCC. That pressure was insane. You know, everything you said, if it was risque, um, they'd actually hit me with fines and not me, but the companies I worked for and that, and, and the whole environment became rather toxic and I mean, I'm really happy on satellite, and I think you'll be happy in this in this medium because you can do whatever you want. And I think people think that when you say you're going to do whatever you want, it's got to be like this most outrageous, dirty thing. It, it's not about that. It's it's more about just having the freedom to, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to speak, uh, pick the topics you want, and kind of come up with your own format in a way. And the format is much different, more different than terrestrial radio. Here he is, terrestrial radio again. And let me give you an example. My wife and I, we drove from Chicago to Pennsylvania over the holidays, and I listened to you interview Adam Sandler, and the interview went probably a good hour. Now, I yeah. was thinking as I'm listening to that, Howard, 
if you're on commercial radio, there's no way you can spend an entire hour with no breaks. And I point that out because the rhythm of the interview, the way it flowed, is a lot different than when you do it in six-minute segments. It's so true. I mean, I remember um, when I... When I when I was on regular radio, sometimes our commercial breaks would be like 23, 24 minutes long because, <laughs> in fact, I would go for like a an hour with something, <laughs> then we'd be backed up. So some people would do their whole commute, and all they'd hear was commercials. Yeah. So it was a bit of a disaster. I when I was a kid, and I listened to the radio with my father. We I would sometimes uh, be in the car with him. Very rarely, he didn't really like me in there, but. He would he'd put the radio on. He was really into this guy Bob Grant, who was this conservative talk show host, kind of like Rush Limbaugh before there was a Rush Limbaugh. And um, and and he would say to me, "It's crazy. We get in the car, we're listening to Bob Grant, and then for ten minutes they'd play the news. Mm-hmm. You know, the newsman would come on the news, and he'd say, I 'I don't want to hear the news. I, I t- I'm tuning in for Bob Grant.' And it was then that I kind of felt." Oh, gosh, if I ever got on the radio, it'd be great not to break for the news. People don't want to hear the news. And they don't, and, and they certainly, you know, I mean, commercials have to be, but at the end of the day, why why are these radio stations putting on the news? And so I always felt like if, if, if I could do an interview and I'm really into it, who the hell wants to stop for anything else but the interview? Yeah. And so, you know, now you're in that position where you can call the shots, and if you have something good going, you can let it roll. And I, I think that's great, you know. Well, just interviewing you would be a bone of contention because I'm sure the management would say, well, wait a minute, he's a competitor. Even though he's on a, a different platform, he's a competitor to what you do. And you yeah, have to we go had th- that for a while because sometimes I would go on some guys' radio shows. I, uh, I'm i trying to think which ones I did. I, I did a couple of them. And, you know, there was always this thing, oh, he's on satellite. And, you know, I, I thought that was so dumb at the time because um, – you know, especially if I get it from fellow broadcasters, I'm talking about guys on the air, and I'd say, well, isn't it great that I'm on satellite in the sense that maybe if this thing works, there'll be more opportunities for all of us, like we, we could get jobs, because I know so many guys like yourself and me who were just completely frustrated in uh, you know regular radio, terrestrial radio, that um, the idea that there was a satellite now meant there's some opportunities to get some work, so... I never saw. I, I never understood it get coming from like guys I knew in broadcasting who were like all hostile about satellite radio. <laughs> yeah. I said, "Man, you don't own any radio stations. What are you worried about?" Yeah, and the internet yeah. is opening up those other channels now too. So it's a different ball game, more than just AM and FM. Now you, I mean, you know, I, there's so many podcasts, and to break through, it's really tough. But you have a built-in audience. You, you know, you have people who have followed you. So you know, you won't have as hard a time it, some guys who just kind of start up out of nowhere it's like almost impossible to be heard through the the clutter the, the, the maze of shows i mean i don't know how many shows are out there you know yeah well i i feel pretty good about this and i'm going to work as hard as i've ever worked and i'll hopefully... and i wish you luck i really do because i've gotten to know you and you know uh, you know you're really just a, a tremendous person and and uh, i always enjoy when we get together with our wives and we have dinner and it's uh, been nice getting to know you, and I, I really am rooting for you and pulling for you. I hope I hope, I hope it all works out. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate you being my very first guest. I really was excited when you said that you would do it, and it really sets the pace car, I think, in the right direction for me. Now, Gary, are you doing the show on your own? Do you have a couple of people, uh, you know? I have a, a woman who's going to do, I'm using the term loosely, news breaks. She was right. on my last show, so I thought I'd add that in there and have some of that as part of the old system into the new, but it'll be adapted for what I'm doing now. Yeah. So so how long's the show? That doesn't matter. I mean, you can just go for as long as you want. I'm shooting for about an hour Monday through Friday. Right. I think that, oh, great. from what I've heard, as far as the Internet universe, that's kind of the amount of time that, that plays, and I'm going to massage that as I go along. But it's wide open. That's the beauty of this. Right. You, don't, you don't know. It could go anywhere from In other here. words, doing a four-hour show seems kind of archaic, right? Well, think about it. I know you do it. But, again, it's a, it's a different animal when you do yeah. it on satellite. And I just think that the way things are going, people seem to like these 
more contained. And with your situation, your show runs over and over all day. If you didn't hear it that particular moment, you can hear it later in the day. You've got the yeah. two channels working. So these are all all different aspects that weren't there 15, 20 years ago. And and that's why this is fun, because it's kind of new again. It, it feels like I'm starting off again with that same enthusiasm and and seeing what's lying ahead is 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 part of the the excitement and all that other stuff that we experienced as we got in to radio many years ago. Let me ask you this, Howard. I saw the series that Seinfeld does, the web series. Yeah, Comedians and Cars. Getting Coffee, and you were on the show, and you and Jerry connected on something that really hit as a touchstone for me when you both said that you were big fans of Mad Magazine growing up. And I think Mad Magazine formed a good part of my sense of humor growing up. And it, it really was one of those things where I thought, why, why are, wow, they're, they're taking off on topics that I thought were taboo. And right. they really pushed the envelope for their era. And then you were on the cover of Mad Magazine. I know. It was like my greatest achievement. I, I, it, when they put me on the cover, I mean, I lived for Mad Magazine. And... Um, yeah, like you said, I, I, you couldn't believe it when you were a kid and you read it, and the you know the usual gang of idiots were the guys who wrote that thing. Mm -hmm. And I could only imagine what you know. I would just sit there and go, "What would that be like to be a part of of what they do?" And uh, they, it was so revolutionary. I mean, Mad Magazine is still around, and yet you know it's it's tame in comparison, and it's 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 even like still such a big deal to me that I was on the cover. And uh, Jerry, Jerry said the same thing, and then we were talking. We both have like a home office, and Jerry's one big picture hanging in the office is his Mad Magazine cover, and so is mine. <laughs> and and mine is I'm in a toilet, and there's a plunger stuck to my head. Yeah, I, I really – that would be, to me, if I could be on the cover of Mad Magazine, again, I've accomplished, I think, all I could ever want. Right. Because growing up – and this is a male thing, I'm sure – Mad Magazine was the comedy Bible. Oh, Yeah. And and um, I remember the way I got Mad Magazine. I you know I was a kid. I'd never heard of it, and I was I was asking my mother for a subscription to Playboy. That's what I wanted more than anything. <laughs> and I, it was like around I was twelve or thirteen years old, and I was just begging for Playboy. That's what I want. And it was really weird. My parents were very conservative in a lot of ways, but when it came to sex, they were incredibly liberal. They, my mother was like. All right, you know, uh, what's the big deal? I'll get you a subscription to Playboy. And uh, it's after all, it's just naked bodies. But just realize those naked bodies are freaks. Real <laughs> women look like me and your sister. You know, she gave me a whole lecture. It was like really scary. I was like, well, okay. But anyway, uh, so she was contemplating me getting Playboy. And then like, a, like two days later in the mail came Playboy. And I couldn't believe that it happened that quickly. So I go up to my room and I open Playboy and I'm reading like weird little comics and Spartacus, uh, you know, a takeoff on Spartacus uh -huh. and um, all kinds of weird stuff in Mad Magazine. And I went like, where's the naked women and stuff? And then um, it dawned on me what had happened. I went down and talked to my mother. My cousin Jack used to paint the covers for all the DC comics. He was a vice president of Warner Brothers. And Mad Magazine was part of their publishing empire. And he found out that I wanted Playboy, so he glued a Playboy cover to a Mad Magazine. Oh, my God. And, and so when I opened this thing up, I had no idea what I was reading, but I loved it. And so, like, like I still wanted the uh, the Playboy magazine, but, but screw that. Once I started reading Mad, I, I, it, mm -hmm. Playboy was almost irrelevant. Right. Mad Magazine was the, the Bible. Yeah. And anybody who thinks in an irreverent way has to have given a nod to Mad Magazine, certainly, because it, it, it just, I, I think Saturday Night Live came out of that and, and you know, and, and everything that is the National Lampoon, certainly, you know. Was it more exciting to be on the cover of Mad Magazine or Rolling Stone? Oh, that's tough. Uh, you know, wow, that, I, I just think they're both equally important. I, like those magazines are iconic and so sad in the magazine industry too when you don't when i see rolling stone downsized and all thin and everything it's just like wow it's hard to figure out because yeah. rolling stone has such importance and it still does to me i still subscribe and read it 
Um, but uh, I, I, I don't think I have. Uh, I'll go with Mad Magazine, but it's pretty close. And you've been on Sirius, now Sirius XM, for over 10 years. Can you believe it's over 10 years already? Yeah, I can't believe it. And, and most people said it was a stupid move because they only had 400,000 subscribers at that point. And they had made a big investment in me, you know, and uh, everyone was just saying it's going to be a disaster. And, um, you know, I, I keep a journal occasionally. I'm not real good at it. But uh, at the time, I was just feeling stressed out, and I started to write my thoughts down about satellite. And I said, I really can envision a universe of 30 million people. And the first day on the air, I was full of bravado, and I said that to Robin. But I really, I really did believe that that could happen within the time I was there. And um, just the other day, they were doing their report, and I think they were about to hit 30 million people, and it was unheard of. And, and Sirius was, there was Sirius and there was XM, and XM was beating the pants off Sirius. Uh, it looked like Sirius was going to fold. Mm -hmm. And a guy named Leon Black owned it, and, and he, uh, I met with him, and he's the guy who hired me. And uh, he said, gee, how many radios can you sell? How, you know, how, many, how many people can you bring to the table? I said, I have no idea. I don't. I can't even guarantee you one person will follow me, um, but you know I'll give it my best shot and I'll try and do some really really great radio for you, and I'd be really excited to do it. But it was a huge gamble, you know. And um, but but I'm so gratified that it took off, and it's it's really quite remarkable actually, you know. And it's great. There's a whole new medium for broadcasters and for you know people who want to. You know, we want to pay for radio and not have all the commercial clutter and all that stuff. And I think it's pretty cool. And you just signed another cycle here for another five years. Yeah, I really didn't know if I was going to do that. But um, we're going to be doing something new. We haven't really named it yet, we're calling it uh, 360, for lack of a better term, because we think it's going to be like a full. We think, we, when I say we, it's not the royal we, but it's a bunch of people working on it. And I've had this vision for um, um, an app and, and doing some stuff within a universe that I think would be really, really good. Uh, if we can if we can get half of it done, I think it'll be exciting. So I've been working on that, and uh, I'm excited about the next five years, yeah, the, the fact that we can still grow. Uh, I'm still working with Robin and uh, Fred and uh, Gary and, you know, my, my usual uh, gang of idiots, right? Yeah, well, let's Myself let's stop included. there for a minute. You have that core group of Robin and, and Baba Booey and Fred. Yeah. And, and that's, what, 25 years, 30 years almost? Yeah, yeah, really long time. It, it, it's, amaz it's an amazing association. And I was listening as part of the Adam Sandler piece in between all that. It was right around the new year, and Robin – was talking about her her health issues that she yep. went through. And I'll tell you, it was very moving to hear her speak about your friendship. And and you can't fake that. It's not, oh, we just get together on the air, and then we go home, and we don't even think about each other. You could tell that was a genuine, deep no, friendship. It's genuine. I have a genuine affection for Robin. I, I, I don't think I would have uh, had the career I've had if it wasn't for Robin. And uh, I'm very grateful to Robin. And I have tremendous respect for her. And I, I think she's a, a an unbelievable broadcaster. So, you know, look, I know uh, with you and uh, Steve, it, it was a very, very rough uh, thing at the end to break up because it is, it's, it's like a marriage. It's really no joke when you work that closely with someone every day. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of mind blowing how much time you spend together and, and we know how many of those relationships can go bad. But I, I think at the end of the day, Robin and I just have a, a great love for each other and value what, uh, what we do, you know, and, and value what we both contribute. And so when she got cancer, I, my, my world was rocked. I, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I, I just uh, was told the worst diagnosis. She had a very serious cancer. And, and, they, and they said, well, it's going to, you know, it's all going to kind of be over. We we didn't even know if she would survive. Hmm. And uh, some of the doctors I spoke to said, that, you know, look, maybe they can extend her life, but uh, it doesn't look good. I met one doctor. I kept talking to doctors uh, because they knew Robin. While Robin was pursuing, you know, doctors and stuff, I knew that she was in such a bad shape that maybe I could talk to some other people for her. And uh, she gave me permission to speak to people. And 
I went out and tried to, you know, somehow find some people who were a little more hopeful, and we we did find someone out of uh, L.A. who was really helpful, uh, Dr. Agus. We've had him on the show. The guy's written a couple of books. He's fabulous. And he uh, he said, you know what? Let's go for a cure here. And I was like, wow, really? And he goes, yeah, I think I think there's a cure. And you know, Robert went through a 12-hour operation, and you know, it was a whole saga. But at the end of the day, he was right. And I don't know why the fuck I keep saying end of the day, but I am. <laughs> but uh, I don't normally say that. But but really, we, the, the point being that uh, I, I don't know that I would have wanted to continue broadcasting without Robin. That just makes me feel good, and and, um, and that, she's uh, very respectful of what I, what I do and, and vice versa. So it works out, you know. That's how deep these relationships go. I'm not talking just about the people that work on the shows. That's the whole deal with radio. It's the visit with you and the audience. And if they connect, it's fabulous. And to get that connection and to keep it, it's it's so hard to do sometimes. When you get it, there's nothing like it. It's so euphoric. Yeah, it really is. I mean, I, I remember a couple of years ago, you, you sat in when we do our, we do these sort of regular meetings where we all touch base and talk about what we want to do and what our goals are, you know, that's how that's how uh, I like to do the show. And uh, there's a real feeling of camaraderie uh, around what we do. And and there's a bunch of people who are also just working on, we have two full-time channels on Sirius, and there's a lot of programming and a lot of uh, considerations there. So it's a pretty big effort, you know, but I, I think it's so great with what you're doing and, and, and uh, what happened for me at, at Satellite you, you just feel like you have some control over it, and you can put out there what, what, what it is you really want. The last six months at the place I was at, they took me off the AM, which was going well, and out of nowhere they pulled me off of there and put me on their digital platform. And, Howard, you know this, and it probably was the same feel you had the first few days on Sirius. And I'm sitting there, and I talked – I remember this – the first day I talked for an hour and 45 minutes straight because I had been <laughs> – under a format for my entire career. I thought right. I was in heaven. Yeah, yeah, it's great. You know, it, it really is something. You know, I, I think one of the things, too, is it's sort of dangerous because there are some people who are just genuinely boring, and you put them on a microphone, and if they go for, for 10 minutes, you want to <laughs> just say to them, you need to be reined in, you need a program director, and you need to mm -hmm. uh, really take stock of what, what it is you're doing. And so, uh, you know, I think one of the good things, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but one of the good things about terrestrial radio was that there were ratings and that there were, you actually got a, a, an evaluation of how you were doing, and the audience gave you direct feedback. Sure. And so we had the benefit of that. And I, I think when, when people podcast who don't have the benefit of that, they, they, they don't get that. Discipline sense of the audience and what really what their attention span is, you know. I agree totally. I'm so glad we came up the way we came up and then transferred yeah. into this because it would be a whole different ball game, as you said, if you just plopped yourself in and start yeah. yapping about this and that. That's not how it works. Yeah, no, it doesn't work all that well. But that's you know, I got on the radio one time and I was talking about how I thought I, I got a lot of shit for it. I said. Um, you know, podcasting is just you know stupid and dumb, and I you know, and I got like, I got I got so much hell for it. And but I, I was making the point that you know guys like you or Corolla or um, uh, Mark uh, Maron, you know, who Mark Maron? Yeah, Mark Maron. You know, yes, there is. Of course, there are successes in podcasting. I was kind of referring to not kind of. I was referring to. People who get on the, you know, who who get in their living room essentially and just talk for for four hours straight, and uh, really nobody's listening to them, and they're not getting any kind of guidance. I said I didn't think that was valuable, and I didn't th see it as a credible way to make a living. I don't think, you know, I think that's just kind of a disaster. So that's what my point was. It's funny. With all this freedom comes great responsibility. Exactly. You got to manage yeah. it. It's not just getting yeah. on and, and spewing for a few hours. And it's funny you said that because I was listening to some radio, regular radio over the holidays again. I don't do that very often anymore. Yeah. But I said to my wife, I said, have you noticed on these music formats, if they let them talk, which is all of eight seconds, yeah. they will either do the weather or tell you how close we are to the weekend, right? Right. That's all they say. This is funny. This was the day, no, and it wasn't the holidays, it was the day after Labor Day. 
guy comes on between records and said, hey, we're only four days away from the weekend because we had Labor Day off. <laughs> and I thought, you. this is right after I said to my wife, they either say the weather or how close <laughs> we are to the weekend, and this guy pays off right there. And she's like, wow, you really know your business. <laughs> yeah, well, too, it, it can be a really dumb business that way, and, and uh, sometimes it, it's really shameful. I, I, and I think sometimes people are, are told to say that stuff, like a program director will say, hey, just, you know, just talk about how close we are to the weekend and shut up. But, you know, who knows? It is, it is a great way to make a living if it, if it works out and you do get some freedom eventually. And uh, because I, I don't think there's anything more exciting than radio. I still feel that way. I, I love uh, going on. I love that intimacy and I love the fact that it's immediate and live. So I, I don't think I ever got tired of that. I, I just think it's, it's great. That was part one of the interview with Howard. Part two will air on Friday. That is episode four. And I want to, again, thank Howard for taking the time to do this. He really doesn't do other radio shows. He's got his own platform, of course. And if he goes outside of that, it's usually on a TV show. So I am more than grateful for him to take the time and talk with me today. And again, part two coming up on Friday. Let's get into a little new stylings with Leslie Kiling. Not one to shy away from controversy, Caitlyn Jenner is making waves again by going after Hillary Clinton. On the latest episode of I Am Kate, Jenner called Mrs. Clinton a lousy senator and an effing liar. Wow. And he used the whole word there for what kind of liar he thought she was. Why, why la- is she a liar? I mean, outside of the stuff that we know about, is she going I- with something else? Uh, I think Caitlin is calling out Mrs. Clinton regarding Benghazi. I think that's what set that whole thing off. A law allowing physician-assisted suicide goes into effect in California on June 9th. Now that the date's been set, opponents of the bill are stepping up calls for its repeal over concerns that it may be misused against the disabled. GM is joining the movement toward driverless cars. The auto giant just plunked down more than a billion dollars to purchase cruise automation. Cruise Automation is a Silicon Valley company focusing on autonomous vehicle technology. A woman in Bulgaria is taking heat for killing a swan so she could take a selfie with it. The woman dragged the bird from the pond, took some pictures, then left the injured bird to die on the shoreline. Animal advocates are asking for help in identifying her. And in other animal news, the world's most famous killer whale is in critical condition and not expected to survive much longer. Officials at SeaWorld say Tilikum is suffering from an untreatable lung infection. The 12,000-pound orca made headlines in 2010 when he dragged his trainer to her death in front of a horrified audience. I knew this was going to happen. I've been down to SeaWorld, and as part of the exhibition, they would put this giant cigarette in the whale's mouth. And the cigarette, <laughs> would, he, he would puff it for a few times and then go underwater and then jump out of the water and da-da-da. But I knew because these cigarettes were giant for this whale. And I thought, that's not going to lead to anything good. And here we are, lung cancer. Giant cigarettes. Hey, that giant cigarettes lead to giant, giant lung infections. Right. Uh, that whale has killed three people. Yeah, the trainer was the last. Right, one. that's the last one. But that that whale has chalked up uh, three on the tote board. But again, and that's why I go with my little tenants about killer whales. Kill. It's right in the title, killer <laughs> whale. Vegas gambling, Las Vegas gambling. It's all in the title. So there should be no mystery about what these things do, what they are, right? Uh, That's why I made that list years ago, because when that woman that sued McDonald's because the hot coffee was hot, that's Mm -hmm. where I thought, wait a minute, it's hot coffee. It's not lukewarm. It's not cold coffee. It's not iced coffee. That's a separate order. It's hot coffee. That's why you shouldn't put it between your legs. That's what she did. She put it between her legs. The lid came off. Okay, uh, what more do you need to know? All right, so that poor whale is now dying. How old is that whale? Do you know? I in dog I years. Tell you in a, <laughs> yeah. in a minute here. Um, yeah, I'm. It's been around. I mean, a long time, and I don't know what the lifespan of a whale is, but 
Well, his is longer than you'd expect after killing three people. But one <laughs> of them was a drunk guy who got into the uh, uh, that, enclosure and they found him naked the next day. Yeah, that's uh, culling the herd. That's perfectly acceptable. That doesn't count against the whale's record. So I'm just going to accuse him of two deaths. And even then, killer whale. That's what I do. What do you want from me? There you go. That's why when these people get bitten by a shark in the ocean, okay, that's not a story. If you're bitten in your bathroom, if it comes up through the toilet, that's a story. Or in your bathtub. Not in the ocean. That's where they live. These people that are attacked by bears in the woods, and then they go out and they kill the bear. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. What did the bear do wrong? That's where the bear lives. It wasn't in your house. There's a story I saw the other day, an alligator in a pool in Florida, and they got the alligator out, and then they euthanized it. And I thought, oh. and then they cut it up for meat or whatever. I thought, wait a minute, what? You, did you have to euthanize it? Why can't you just take it back and dump it in the Everglades or wherever you dump the alligator? I never got that word euthanized. That sounds like it should be part of the vernacular of a cosmetic surgeon. I'm going to euthanize you. Make you look younger. That's a, that's a not that's that's not a good word for what they do with it. Euthanize. By the way, Tilikum is thought to be around thirty-five years old. The wow. average life expectancy for a wild male orca is around thirty. So he, he's already more than lived a, a full full orca life. And I got to tell you, the weight issue. Look at how big he was. We knew that weight was going to be an issue. He just couldn't take it off, and it just killed him. That and the cigarettes. <laughs> uh, speaking of cigarettes, there's a list of the most expensive cities on the planet, and London is in the top 10. And it also said that London has the most expensive cigarettes of any of the cities in the top 10. A pack of cigarettes in London is $14.20. And I'm thinking if you're a smoker and in the Chicago area, they've been around $10 a pack for a couple of years. Now, I know you can get them a little cheaper if you shop around and this and that, but $14 a pack. And if you have a couple pack a day habit, that's a car payment every month. And that's got to be a tough road to, to hoe if you're a chain smoker or whatever. And and on a rather normal income. So don't... 900 bucks a month? That's, Almost that's, 900 bucks a month. That's two packs a day in London. Wow. That's what your number is, $900 a month, if it's $14 a pack. Well, $28 a day. 15. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So and, we're, and, we're getting up there. And these people in Europe, they smoke like chimneys over there. They love their ciggy butts. So you're going to see a lot of, lot of uh, Londoners dropping of lung cancer because, or giving it up because it's too expensive. Well, Why London? I mean, I don't. I don't. Take Fourteen I, drinks at a sitting. Between that, you're right. Between the cigarettes and the drinking, they should be culling the herd very quickly over there. Although they've been smoking like that for many, many years. So I don't know if that that seemed like a stupid uh, highlight there. Oh, Londoners are going to be dropping of cigarette. Cancer, da, da da da. No, they've been smoking for years. So whatever's happening, I don't know. I don't live there. I don't know. But uh, it's fourteen dollars and twenty cents a pack. So if you're going over there and you're a smoker, you might want to stock up with ciggies because it's going to kill you otherwise, financially. <laughs> uh, that's all of your news, Leslie. Uh, yeah. And I want to tell you about the big Fiat sale that's going on at Bettenhausen Fiat of Tinley Park in Illinois. And that's the Midwest number one Fiat studio. If you live anywhere in the tri-state area, Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana, go to this Fiat dealer. If you're looking for a Fiat, they will take care of you. The price is incredible. They've got their spring clearance event going on. Mike Bettenhausen is clearing the lot. You could take advantage of Mike's OCD and save on every new Fiat. He doesn't like things cluttering. And he wants to get those lots cleared out. So choose from a new Fiat 500, 500L, or the all-wheel drive 500X. Hey, springtime, take your top off and drive away in the Fiat 500 Cabrio convertible. And put the top down on the car and yourself if you want. Let Lisa Castillo and the entire Bettenhausen staff prove to you 
it's better at Bettenhausen. You can view their complete Fiat inventory at Fiat USA of Tinley Park.com. And I want to thank them for sponsoring the program. I've known them for many, many years. Great people. They've been in business for 60 years. Check them out in Tinley Park, Illinois, the number one Fiat dealer in the Midwest. Here's a story where I can picture the Three Stooges actually doing this as one of their sketches. This is out of Cairo. Eight Egyptian museum officials are to face a disciplinary tribunal for their role in a botched repair job that caused lasting damage to the famed golden burial mask of King Tut, one of the country's most prized artifacts. The judicial action is the latest step in an embarrassing saga at the state-run Egyptian Museum in Cairo. All right, here it is. When workers accidentally knocked the beard from the 3,300-year-old artifact as they repaired a light fixture in its display case and then made things worse by trying to glue it back on. Okay, this, this is almost like it's an onion story, but it's legit. Tourists took photos of museum employees. This is out of the New York Times. As they reattached the blue and gold beard using an insoluble epoxy resin, that left a visible ring of glue around the edge of the beard. Fears that the damage was irreversible proved unfounded, however, after German experts carefully removed the epoxy and restored the solid gold mask using beeswax, the adhesive used by the ancient Egyptians. It did suffer some scratches, though, because of these stunads uh, trying to do what they were doing. But... Isn't there some kind of protocol when the light goes out in the display case with one of the most treasured archaeological finds ever? And you got these guys in there <laughs> taking the light bulb out. Uh oh. Uh oh. You knocked his beard off, you idiot. Ow! Ow! And I, I, it's a poor imitation of some of the Stooges. But anyway, that's what I pictured the Three Stooges doing this, knocking the beard off. Now, give me the glow. And then they just start sticking it back on. So, again, there's no process of how you handle things when you're cleaning the display cases, obviously. And then if you damage something, there's no, okay, don't try to repair it yourself. Just come to the front office and we'll take care of it. So they just try to stick it back on. Like when you break the handle off a coffee cup at home, you get the Gorilla Glue out and just do it yourself. Oh, tut. I'm sorry. (laughs) I am really sorry for all that. And uh, that's your Stunad of the hour story. There's been uh, this in Florida. I I can't believe it's out of Florida. You never hear about goofy people in Florida doing anything strange. This is a guy, 27 years old, arrested on allegations of taking upskirt photos of girls in a Publix in Orlando. Maybe he saw pubics when he walked in. I don't know. Well, I'm sure he did. Scott Wesley Irwin was arrested of charges of video voyeurism. On two separate occasions last month, a customer inside the Publix saw Irwin place his cell phone in a basket and record video under the skirts or shorts of girls. So he's got, they have those little baskets. If you don't want to get a cart, those baskets with the handle and you get a You get a few items, you just carry that around. That must have been what he was doing. But you really have to kind of get under the skirt or shorts of these girls to do that. You really have to hold it under there. It would be, to me, kind of obvious. But again, maybe you're shopping and not paying attention. We had a rash of these in Chicago a few years ago. The guy would have a shoe phone, and he would get on an escalator. And that seems a little more doable, not to encourage anybody to do this, but That's the way he was caught because he had a shoe camera. This is something I've never heard about before where you put it in a basket and then you hold the basket under the the girl's skirt. And this is a great example. It says here, if you see something, say something, according to the Orlando police. A customer turned the guy in. He saw something going on and notified the store manager. So that's how they caught this guy. But uh, that's why I... Used to go a little commando in the summer when I was wearing a skirt, and now 
I, I got underwear on all the time when I'm wearing my skirt because there are too many crazies out there. You've got the British guy here who, drunk, was caught urinating against a shop door and told to move along. And he vented his anger by headbutting a brick wall, knocking himself temporarily unconscious in the process. He concussed himself, I think. Okay, this is something that's intrigued me for a while. When you see these fights in movies and one guy headbutts another guy and the other guy either is knocked out or goes falling on his ass. And how come the guy that administered the headbutt doesn't suffer anything because he's hitting his forehead too against another forehead. I don't understand why he doesn't suffer any consequences. Is it because the force is moving forward? But I would still think that there'd be some pain felt on the distributor of said headbutt. But I don't know. I've never done it. I don't want to find out by trying it. But this is a guy who knocked himself out by headbutting a wall, which kind of adds to my argument. That's what happens when you hit your own head against something hard. Now, having read that, I saw this other story about the drinking that's going on in Great Britain. Figures from the Office for National Statistics show that almost one in 10 drinkers, about two and a half million people, consume more than 14 units in a single session. With younger groups, surprise, most likely to binge drink. New drinking guidelines published in January said men and women should stick to 14 units of alcohol per week. So that's two a day, two drinks a day. Okay, 14 drinks in one day. I don't think I have that many drinks in six months. If I go out, okay, I'm not a big drinker, I admit it. But still, who can drink 14 drinks in one sitting? Even if it's beer. And I know some people, oh, you're a freaking lightweight. Yeah, okay, 14 drinks. You need 14 drinks for whatever. And the new guidelines are just have two a day. Although my doctor did tell me, my eye doctor especially, said that red wine, a glass or two of red wine every day, will help with the eyesight, kind of prevent cataracts and everything. So I've been on that diet for a while. That doesn't sound too bad. A couple glasses of red wine. And in Europe, the kids start drinking. We know that. The kids start drinking wine when they're really young. So it's very acceptable and pervasive in Europe. But here... That has never been the case. I, I don't remember kids drinking with their parents or anything. Every now and then, yeah, a kid's father would go, hey, you want to taste a beer? And I remember the first time I tasted a beer and how vile it was. And I thought, okay, uh, that's not going to be something I enjoy. But I got older and eh, I'll have a beer or two once in a while. But it's, it's not, not something I'm looking forward to every day where two and a half million people in Great Britain are to the tune of 14 drinks a day. Now, I move on to this struntz, stunad, stupido. This is out of Savannah, Georgia. An infant is doing fine after a woman left the child at a grocery store because uh, she was shoplifting and she skedaddled, but she left the baby behind. And I don't know when bouts she realized that. And now you're caught in kind of this, okay, what do I do? Do I go back and get my kid and hope they don't recognize me? Do I hope the kid is still sitting there by him herself and I can just grab the kid and run and keep whatever I shoplifted? Or do I write the kid off and keep the dry goods that I've shoplifted and just call it a day? That's your head scratcher for the day. Should have thought about that a little more. Wait, I left and I got the stuff I stole, but didn't I have a kid when I went in there to shoplift? Eh, I can't remember now. Hackers helped themselves to $81 million after breaching Bangladesh Bank's systems last month, but the massive theft could have been far worse if not for a typo. After successfully transferring $81 million from the bank's account at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York to entities in the Philippines, 
the hackers tried to transfer another $20 million to a Sri Lankan nonprofit, only they wrote Foundation rather than Foundation as part of its name. And that's when the Fed grew suspicious. Otherwise, <laughs> they probably would have gotten away with this. In total, hackers had put in almost three dozen transfer requests and planned to steal another $850 million. It should be harder to make a transfer of $81 million than whatever happened here. Even if you had all the numbers and everything, shouldn't there be a, well, that's a lot of money. We're going to have to take a little look at that before we make the transfer. You Am want I, them to show their license? Yeah. Some identification. <laughs> Something. For $81 million? No wonder everything's kind of screwed up in our banking system. Foundation? What's that, George? I don't know. Let's take a look at that. Hey, wait a minute. Officials suspect stolen funds were diverted to banks and casinos and say accounts that receive the funds have been frozen. All right. And a woman caught with her pants down driving into a Waffle House. How many times have we heard this story? She thought she was hitting the brake and she hit the gas pedal and went into the restaurant. And there's a reason she was drunk. Okay. But here's the second part of the oddity. She had no pants on when she got out of the car. I'm going to drive drunk to the Waffle House with no pants on. That's somebody's thought process. Wakes up, probably didn't shower, I'm going to guess here. I'm going to the Waffle House, but I'm not putting any pants on. And here we go. Okay, I don't know if this woman had underwear on. She didn't have any pants on, but if she didn't have any underwear on, and if she did, she's going to need to get it cleaned anyway. I feel sorry for her because that story is out of Texas. But if she lived in the Chicago area or Minneapolis, she could take all of her laundry to CD One Price Cleaners because they've got this deal going. They will wash, dry, and fold your laundry for $1.49 a pound. Yep, $1.49 per pound. You like doing laundry? I, I don't do laundry. I'm sure that you probably don't like doing it most of the time, or maybe you do. Maybe you think it's very zen. I would imagine most people don't. So here's how to not have to do it. Take it to CD, one price cleaners for that one low price of $1.49 a pound, and you'll get it back washed, dried, and folded. That is a nice touch. And they have this deal where if you bring it in by 10 and you can get it back by 5, no problem, and that's not any extra charge. Some cleaners for same-day service, they have an extra charge for that. That is not the case at CD One Price Cleaners. They've got 30 locations in the Chicago and suburban area, and they have locations in Minneapolis. To find the location nearest you, go to cdonepricecleaners.com. I've been going to CD One Price Cleaners for a number of years. They also have free gourmet coffee. So you drop your stuff off, grab that cup of coffee, you're on your way. And if you want it back that day, there you have it, if you get it in before 10 o'clock. CD One Price Cleaners, one day, one price clean. All right, that's it. Don't forget, part two of my conversation with Howard Stern will be on Friday. That is a free show. Tomorrow will be a premium content show, if you'd like to check that out. In addition to that, I have a show on my premium content that will feature an interview I did with the bass player of Paul Schaefer's band for the entire run of the David Letterman show. And here's a clip. The very last concert that George Harrison did uh, under his own name was, was a, a one-off that he did um, in London at the Royal Albert Hall. And I get a phone call one time. Uh, my brother, my brother Rob does a great impression of George Harrison with the sort of, sort of like throaty Liverpool <laughs> accent, you know. And it's an early clue to the new direction. Yes, I don't do a good George. Uh, well, I, but. well, I don't like your tie for starters. You know? <laughs> and my brother left. Uh, I thought my brother was leaving a message on my answering machine. When I got home, I heard the "Hello, Will. This is George Harrison calling." And he says, uh, <laughs> "I'd like you to join me if I could steal you from that television program to come and do a thing with me in a Royal Albert Hall." And here's the number and blah blah. And I said, so I, I, I knew it was my brother, so I didn't respond. Oh, you thought you knew it was your brother? Oh, I was sure. So I called my brother at the end of the night and I said, "Hey, great George on the uh, answering machine earlier today. That was really funny." And he goes, "What do you mean? I didn't call you." And I go, "Uh oh." Let me call you right back. I got to go take.